This video was made with support from my patrons, whose names are on screen now. If you want to, you can join them today and even get access to exclusive content. The link to my Patreon is in the description, so check it out if you're interested. Anyway, on with the show. This is Vision Gran Turismo. Yeah, that probably wasn't what you were expecting, but it is. See? The wording is right here. This trailer is from E3 2005, and Vision Gran Turismo was the original name for Gran Turismo HD Concept, a showcase of what the series would be like on the PlayStation 3. As it turned out, GTHD ended up nothing like this, which is basically just Gran Turismo 4 with a bunch more cars on the track. Maybe they should have made this instead. And, as you can probably tell, the Vision GT name ended up getting reused for something completely different. Anyway, that has nothing to do with today's video, I just thought it'd be fun to mention. So, Vision GT. Let's cut straight to the chase. Some people love it, and others couldn't care less. So, what's the big deal? You know, I like to talk about the most controversial topics in the GT community, and frankly, with modern Gran Turismo, there is no shortage of ideas. But in a stroke of wonderful timing, we're just about at the 10 year anniversary of Vision GT. No, the other one. So what I thought we'd do is take a look back through the history of Vision GT, its origins, its goals, and its continuing legacy over the past decade. On paper, it's an award-winning revolution in video games and the automotive industry, but as you can tell from the title, it has been far from smooth sailing. Let's get into it. Firstly, what is Vision GT? To put it simply, Vision GT is a collaboration between Gran Turismo and various brands, mostly within the automotive industry, to design and create concept cars specifically for these games, as a celebration of the 15th anniversary of the franchise. The producer of Gran Turismo, Kazunori Yamauchi, has gone on record saying that he approached various brands, asking them what their ideal vision of a Gran Turismo sports car would be. Vision. Gran Turismo. Do you get it? It's an interesting idea, and also very impressive when you consider that even 10 years prior to the start of Vision GT in 2013, they were struggling to even get some of these brands in the game. And now they're working directly with these manufacturers to produce content specifically for the games. What a turnaround. But it's not as if this idea came out of nowhere. It definitely already had its roots in the series. Generally speaking, a concept car is a showcase. Whether it be for the design and styling, or specific technology, they offer a preview into the future of a brand. Some concept cars stay concepts forever, and others are eventually morphed into production models. Many times this is planned from the start, but sometimes there's so much interest in a concept that a company ends up producing a production car based on it when they never intended to in the first place. Gran Turismo has featured concept cars from the very beginning. The Dodge concept car was the very first. It was previously known as the Copperhead, but due to a legal dispute it ended up with its very generic name instead. And since then, concept cars have always featured in Gran Turismo. In 2002, Polyphony even created Gran Turismo Concept, a racing game made to showcase concept cars that were shown at various motor shows around the world. One example included a concept for the next generation R35 GTR that debuted at the 2001 Tokyo Motor Show. And now, 22 years later, the production model GTR is still being sold, albeit only in Japan and North America. And before Vision GT, there was also a precedent for Gran Turismo collaborating with other automotive companies. In GT Concept, there was the Nismo Fairlady Z S-Tune concept by Gran Turismo, in which the Gran Turismo team assisted with some of the aerodynamic design. The same was true for the Amuse S2000 GT1, a highly tuned version of the Honda S2000 which appeared in GT4. Another tuned S2000 came from Opera Performance, which was developed using data provided by simulations within Gran Turismo. And Opera's tuned 350Z again had some aerodynamic designs which were created by Gran Turismo. All of these were real cars which Gran Turismo actually had a hand in designing through joining forces with their respective companies. Funnily enough, in Gran Turismo 5 Prologue, there was a Tune 350Z branded under Gran Turismo, which was jointly developed by both Opera and Amuse. Opera did the bodywork and chassis, and Amuse tuned the engine and suspension, although as far as I can tell, this car was never produced in real life. But in reality, there was a Gran Turismo 4 limited edition version of the Nissan 350Z which was sold in Europe. 
and obviously was in GT4 as well. A few years later, Polyphony again worked with Nissan to create the multifunction display for the previously mentioned R35 GTR. And of course, there's the concept car which we all know and love, the Nike One 2022. Recently, it's mostly known as a bit of an inside joke, but this futuristic concept was designed by Phil Frank specifically for the game, and as such, many people consider it as the progenitor of today's Vision GT. However, the true spark for Vision GT came a little bit later on. In 2008, Gran Turismo collaborated with Citroen to design the GT by Citroen, an electric supercar. The story of its creation was that the Citroen designer who came up with it, Takumi Yamamoto, was actually a childhood friend of Kaz, and supposedly the idea had been mooted as early as 2003. The concept car first featured in GT5 Prologue, with a road car version also featuring from GT5 onwards, which was powered by a V8 petrol engine instead. Although there were plans to create six real-life models of the car, only one was created, and it was powered by a Ford Modular V8, which actually produced more power than the road car in-game. Anyway, this whole process of working with a manufacturer to create a concept car for the game seemed to light a fire under Kaz. His mindset was that Gran Turismo could be used as a reason for these manufacturers and designers to create incredible concepts that they would otherwise have no reason to create. Arguably, the Red Bull X cars, designed by famed Formula 1 designer Adrian Newey, which also debuted in GT5, come from this line of thinking. And thus, a few years later, Vision GT was born. So that's Gran Turismo's journey, but what about these manufacturers? What's in it for them? When Vision GT was announced, there were already 18 companies lined up who agreed to be a part of it, but how did they know it would even be worthwhile? This really digs into why these manufacturers make concept cars in the first place. I've mentioned that concept cars are showcases, and that's true in multiple ways. They can act as a showcase of what the brand is capable of, and also what that brand stands for, and why people should be invested in what they produce. Now, taking this to the medium of video games, there are many benefits. Of course, one is that they don't actually have to build the concept in real life, but a lot of them choose to do that anyway. A more important factor is how they can use it to engage with a new audience. Let's be real, most younger people are not that interested in motor shows, even if they have an interest in cars. So debuting a new concept at a motor show isn't likely to see much attention from this audience. And of course, a big part of building brand engagement is appealing to the next generation and trying to build some sort of attachment between them and the brand. That is how you make a lifelong fan. But with Vision GT, these brands can now say, we've made this car specifically for your favourite game, and you can go into the game and experience what it would be like to actually drive. That is a big difference to just simply looking at a real-life concept model, which in most cases is just a rolling chassis, or is built on top of a much less interesting car. This may not be exactly how it works in reality, but from listening to these manufacturers when they talk about their Vision GT projects, it's clear that a lot of them think this way. But it's not just about their brand identity. These manufacturers can use their Vision GT project as a testbed. Like I've said, concept cars often preview future ideas, and with Vision GT, this is no different. For instance, the Bugatti Vision GT car previewed design elements of the Bugatti Chiron months before the Chiron was actually revealed. The same can be said to a lesser degree about the Nissan Vision GT and renders of the R36 GTR from earlier this year, where some of the styling cues have been taken. The design of the McLaren Vision GT has impacted two cars, the US exclusive McLaren Sabre and then the track only McLaren Solus GT, which looks extremely similar. The Ferrari Vision GT, released last year, also bears a strong similarity to the Le Mans winning 499P hypercar, which makes sense given they were being designed at roughly similar times and the Vision GT is based on the same platform. Also, a handful of these models which have been made in real life are actually functional. The Bugatti, which is currently owned by a private collector, the Volkswagen and the Audi Vision GT cars have all been seen to move under their own power. It's very unlikely that they have the same performance as they do in the game, but nobody knows for certain. So, from everything I've said so far, this is brilliant. Vision GT is great from everyone's perspective. Gran Turismo gets to work directly with these companies to produce exclusive content for the game. The manufacturers are able to show what their designers are capable of, let their imaginations run wild and potentially reach a new audience. And as players, we get to reap the benefits of all of this by enjoying these cars in the game. However, if you've been involved in Gran Turismo discourse over the past, say, 10 years, you will know that the final part of that statement isn't really telling the full story. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is going to take some explaining. As we've discussed, Gran Turismo has a long and rich history featuring concept cars, but I wouldn't exactly describe it as a happy relationship, at least when you look at it from a player's point of view. Concept cars in previous GT games have also been subject to tighter restrictions in terms of what you can do with them compared to normal production cars and even race cars. At various times in the franchise, you can experience a number of these restrictions. For instance, customization. Depending on the game, and sometimes even the car, it may be the inability to change the wheels, or put on a custom wing, or repaint the car at all. The same applies when it comes to their upgrade potential, which is often a lot lower, and occasionally even non-existent, compared to normal cars. Even the degree of tuning you can do to specific parts is often limited, and in one game in particular, they're barred from entering certain events, even if you may come up against them as opponents in the same event. It makes no sense. At some points, you might question why they even bother putting these cars in the game when they're so limited in terms of what you can even do with them. You could argue that it's the manufacturers putting these limitations on them, but I don't really see why the situation for them would be so much different compared to their road cars. It just seems like polyphony being polyphony, i.e. pointlessly restrictive. Now, if we skip forwards to Gran Turismo 6 and the beginning of the Vision GT program, we can have a look at the context in which these types of cars existed. Firstly, it's important to remember that GT6 didn't get regular content updates. They were quite sporadic, often adding only one or two cars at a time, and very often it was a Vision GT car. If you were already not inclined to like Vision GT, this setup really didn't do it any favours. Many people preferred to have real cars in Gran Turismo, which is a discussion we'll get to later, but when you look at the list of cars added to GT6 in updates, most of them were Vision GTs. The balance was clearly skewed in favour of them, and as content updates were so irregular, if you didn't care much for them, this could become quite frustrating. You could have argued that without the Vision GT cars, we wouldn't have gotten anything to replace them. They were just bonuses, which may be true, but still doesn't feel good, and didn't excuse Polyphony for prioritising them over much more requested additions. So that would be strike one in turning public opinion against the Vision GT. The next thing that also contributed towards that negative sentiment was that despite these cars being made in collaboration with Gran Turismo, and specifically for Gran Turismo 6, somehow most of the Vision GT cars in GT6 do not have modelled interiors. How does that even happen? The game has an interior view. Did they just forget to put on the design brief, oh yeah, make sure you design an interior as well? Although GT6 did away with the premium versus standard descriptions, if these cars were in GT5, that means they would still be listed as standard cars, regardless of the exterior detail. Incredible. Almost every Vision GT from GT Sport onwards has had an interior included, and some from GT6 have had one added, but most GT6 Vision GTs still don't. If they won't add them even 10 years later, I'm not sure they ever will. But if VR really is the future of Gran Turismo, then what are they going to do with them? But anyway, in terms of these cars' functionality within GT6, it wasn't the worst. GT6 had almost 1300 cars by the end of its life, and they came in all shapes and forms. What that meant is that, with the exception of the most extreme Vision GTs, they could all be used somewhere in the game, since it was designed to accommodate all sorts of cars. Despite GT6 easing restrictions for a lot of concept cars when it comes to upgrades and tuning, these Vision GTs are considered special, and as such they stay within a very rigid performance window. It's not great, but it could be worse. How could it be worse? Well, that leads us on to GT Sport. So if Vision GT was the standout initiative within GT6, you'd have to say that for GT Sport, it was Sport Mode. It's kind of in the name. Online racing and esports was clearly the focus, and this was never more true than when GT Sport launched, and there was barely any single player content to speak of in the game. Cars in GT Sport were sorted into categories. Firstly, there was Group N for road cars, and there were also groups 1, 2, 3, 4, and B for race cars. The reason the cars were sorted into these groups was so that a balance of performance, or BOP, system could be used to ensure each car within a group had a similar level of speed. How well this actually worked was debatable, but that was the idea, and it mirrored real life as BOP is used in many motorsport disciplines all over the world. 
The issue with BOP though is that for it to work, all of the cars within a specific group have to start with a roughly similar performance already, and that has to be consistent across the board in all situations. They had to have a roughly similar cornering ability, braking ability, top speed, etc. Because if how each car made its speed over a lap was completely different, the balance would be thrown off massively depending on the circuit. So how exactly would this group of oddball machines that made up the Vision GT roster fit into that? Well, they didn't. Yes, with GT Sport, they really did make a game in which the marquee feature of their previous title and all of the content that came from it was completely and utterly irrelevant. For instance, if you went into arcade mode and tried to use them, your only option was for a one-make race. They were not allowed to race against other cars, not even other Vision GT cars. You see, alongside Group N for road cars, and Groups 1, 2, 3, 4, and B for race cars, there was also Group X. Now, don't be misled, because Group X was not actually a group, it was just a classification for cars which didn't fit into any groups. And of course, this is where all of the Vision GT cars ended up. But to give Polyphony some credit, they did recognise the insanity of this situation to at least some degree, as a few Vision GTs were adapted into versions that could be used in specific groups. I mean, for some, it only added to the unbalanceable clusterfuck that was and still is Group 1, but it was better than nothing. A really frustrating point was that for some reason, a lot of these Vision GTs which could have been considered road cars and thus been used in Group N were not. Again, like limiting the use of concepts in certain events in GT4, there was no reason for this, just an artificial limitation which made these cars less useful for the sake of considering them as special. Just a quick tangent though, putting some of them in Group N would have been better than nothing, but Group N itself was still a complete joke. You see, Group N was the general name, and within that there were many subgroups. You might expect that these subgroups are sorted based on specific types of cars. For example, modern sports cars, classic muscle cars, that sort of thing. When you consider my previous statement about BOP, having cars which are already similar in performance, that just makes sense. But Polyphony didn't do that. No, they created subgroups based on the power of each car. For instance, Group N300 for cars with roughly 250 to 350 horsepower. This meant that in one group, you could find classic sports cars, pickup trucks, hot hatches, and track day cars, and they would somehow try to balance all of them with each other. Of course, it didn't work, because it never would in a million years, and meant that whenever Group N came up in a sport mode race, it was pretty much just a one make for whichever car was clearly fastest at that track within that group. Anyway, with the introduction of the GT League mode post-launch, a couple of events were added for Vision GT cars, so they did eventually get some purpose to exist. But even still, during that time, it was hard to shake the feeling that Vision GT was treated as a bit of a joke. Unlike GT6, content updates in sport were very regular, adding many cars and tracks, and only occasionally would a Vision GT be included. This took away a lot of the Vision GT fatigue that some people felt with GT6's updates, which was good. But even if a lot of these new cars were interesting, the game was designed so that you wouldn't have a reason to care about them. Oh, what's this? A 1000 horsepower Jaguar Vision GT car? Cool, I can't wait to drive it. For 5 minutes before going back to racing Group 3 at the Nordschleifer. That was GT Sport in a nutshell. But with Gran Turismo 7 a few years later, Polyphony had the opportunity to right these wrongs and finally do these Vision GT cars justice. GT7 scrapped the terrible Group N system and replaced it with Performance Points, which had last been used in GT6. It's a much more open system that would allow these cars which were previously considered Group X to be used in a much wider context within the game. This way they could be fully integrated into the game and not just left over to the side like they were in GT Sport and even GT6 to a degree, as the project was just starting out and the cars were being added gradually post-launch. Of course, Sport Mode in GT7 still used the race car groups, understandably as performance points wouldn't make much sense here, but for the main single player and less serious racing, it's perfect. But let's just say that this video would not be titled the way it is if that were actually what happened in GT7. But the difference is that in this case, the issues are not specific to Vision GT, they're shared with many other types of cars in this game.
Vision GT, classic cars, non-grouped race cars, and even group 2 race cars, they all have the same problems. They're not integrated into the main single player with the menu books, and even beyond that, there aren't many other places in the single player where you can even use them, or at least no scenario where you don't have to go completely out of your way and inconvenience yourself just to give these cars purpose. If you've followed my channel, or even just played GT7 yourself, these problems will be evident, so I'm not going to dig into this again. Let's focus on just Vision GT here. Within GT7, there is the Vision Gran Turismo Trophy event, added back in update 1.15. This of course means that the Vision GTs do have some purpose, but in reality, only a couple of them. The issue is that the idea of having an event specifically for Vision GTs is too broad. They represent such a wide range of performance between them, which makes sense given that they're all individual concepts not built with any specific reason. It would be like having an event specifically for cars that are yellow. Yes, they all have that trait in common, but the range of cars you'll get is too wide in terms of performance. To demonstrate, the PP limit for this event is 850, and the fastest opponents will be just under that, such as the Porsche Vision GT. But in that same update 1.15, they added the Suzuki Vision GT, clearly intended for that event. But what you'll find is that if you actually try to use the Suzuki, you'll get completely smoked given that it comes in roughly 200 pp lower than the Porsche, and of course, other than tyres, you can't upgrade it. And even worse is that the AI will sometimes use it, and will actually get lapped by the fastest cars in a 7 lap race. If I were Suzuki seeing this, I would think Gran Turismo were making fun of us, albeit not intentionally. Yeah, great way to showcase the new car guys, it's just embarrassing. Even GT Sport did this better, given there were actually two different Vision GT events catering to two different different performance windows, and even still the spread was quite far. Apart from this one event, standard Vision GTs do not appear in any other races, but one improvement from Sport is that as a player they can be used for more things, used in different events even if they're not intended to, and of course used in custom race to create whatever you want. But the issue is that unless you go out of your way to buy them, you won't have a reason to get them. And part of that comes down to pricing. In every game that they've appeared in, Vision GT cars always cost 1 million credits. It could be the fastest thing on the planet, or a Daihatsu with some stickers and a stupid name. 1 million. Do I need to explain why this is a bad idea? Not really, but what reasons do they have for doing this other than for the sake of standardising the prices? I don't really see one. Back in GT6, whenever they added a new Vision GT, there would be a time trial in which you could win the car. This was great, because it gave people a reason to care and to check out the car, and maybe they'd really enjoy it. Outside of the menu books, GT7 is allergic to prize cars, and unless you win one in a roulette, you're going to have to buy these Vision GTs if you want them. But the game gives you absolutely no reason to want them, so you can see the problem. This one-size-fits-all strategy also creates contradictions in other areas, such as the SRT Tomahawk, which has four variations fitting different performance brackets, but they all cost the same, so what's the point? But actually, not all Vision GTs cost 1 million credits. For example, the Suzuki Vision GT later got a Group 3 race car version, which costs 450,000 credits, to bring it in line with other Group 3 cars. So, the race car, which is more powerful, faster, and far more useful than the road car, costs half as much. You know, car pricing has always been a contentious issue with GT7, but this has been mostly related to trying to reflect real-world car prices in the game. Vision GT cars can cost anything because they were made for the game. If they're not even going to bother trying to price them in a way that makes sense within the context of the game, then what is the point? Why 1 million credits? It's just an arbitrary figure. Nothing in relation to these cars seems to matter. I've seen some people say that they don't want these hypothetical Vision GT cars mixed in with the real cars. They should be kept separate. This idea was more common back when Vision GT was first starting out, but regardless, I still completely disagree with it. Sure, it may look a bit weird if you have these futuristic designs and more normal production cars side by side, but is that really such a big price to pay to have these cars actually feel like they're part of the game? 
The biggest problem with Vision GT is how these cars are isolated in the game. They exist practically within their own bubble. Back when it was just the Nike one in GT4, this didn't really matter, but as of writing there are currently 51 different variations of Vision GT cars in GT7. That is more than 10% of the total car list in the game. Like I've said, many of the issues are not specific to Vision GT, but these are cars made especially for the game. If you're not going to include them as a core part of the game, what the f*** is the point? When they do this to the classic cars and other race cars, it's still terrible, but I can't emphasise this enough that Vision GT cars exist for literally no other purpose. But when you look at the facts, some of them still don't have interiors. None of them can be upgraded. They have very limited tuning and customization, and little to no purpose or incentive to ever want to own them. It's just a joke. They've taken some of the core features and core ideas of Gran Turismo out of these cars, and then somehow still expect us to care about them. That is the truth. You might have noticed that throughout this video, I've never once questioned the concept of Vision GT and why it exists in the first place, merely the execution of it. That's not to say that I think it's a flawless idea or anything, but I do enjoy the cars it produces. Stuff like the BMW, Honda, Infiniti and Suzuki Vision GTs are some of my favourites. From that selection you can probably tell that my preference is more for the realistic concepts rather than the futuristic ones. Some of them though I'm really not a fan of, but I'd say they've had more hits than they've had misses. And of course part of that is why I care so much about how badly they continue to screw up their usage in these games. But of course, not everyone cares as much. Whether these cars are integrated well or not, some people will have no interest either way. Take a look at this comment section if you don't believe me, because there's bound to be a few. And a big part of that comes down to the real versus fake debate. Some people detest the idea of fictional cars in Gran Turismo, but why? Lots of racing games have made up cars, and it's very rarely an issue. Well, to be honest, it's more to do with what Gran Turismo stood for. As I touched on in my duplicate cars video, real cars were a massive draw of Gran Turismo in the early days. If the original Gran Turismo had featured made up cars, it would have still been good, but there's no way it would have been as much of a smash hit as it was. That relatability and drawing from real life experiences was a huge part of it, and of course you don't get that with these Vision GTs made for the game. Also with made up cars in other games, it's always either or. Either all of the cars are real, or they're all made up. Very rarely will you find a mixture of the two. And as I mentioned, some people can take issue when you do have this mixture, hence some wanting to keep them separate. Something similar but on a much smaller scale is with the in-game sponsors. Gran Turismo always had real-life sponsor logos advertised on their tracks, and in the early days it was quite novel, since no other racing games really did that. But starting with GT Sport, they included some made-up ones as well. I've never really known why, since they still have plenty of real-life sponsors, but they did and have continued doing so. In some ways it can create a disconnect, and for a lot of people that's probably part of it, seeing these hyper-futuristic machines in this game which sells itself on its realism. Of course the degree of this depends on the car, so I'm not saying it's the same across the board. Also, if you take a Vision GT car, it doesn't matter which one it is, you can look at it, understand some of the design decisions, and appreciate it for what it is. But that's looking at it from the perspective of a car enthusiast. If you purely look from a player's point of view, if I'm being brutal, none of that stuff really matters. Who designed the car, what the intentions for its design were, and what it may preview for the future are kind of irrelevant. All it's really judged on will be what it is and what it can do in the game. Whether it is penned by a legendary designer or some intern at Polyphony, sometimes it can be hard to tell from looks alone. As I cannot overstate, these cars are made primarily for the game. If they weren't being made for the game, maybe as real life concepts or for some other project, how they would be viewed would be completely different. There's no doubt that Vision GT is a positive thing when viewed from outside of these games. The freedom that it permits designers to have and gives them reason to design some fascinating concepts. 
I'm sure that many breakthroughs have been made under the Vision GT program as a result of this, thus furthering automotive design. And all of the critical recognition and awards the program has received over the years are certainly warranted. We've seen firsthand what sort of impact it can have with helping to define certain design directions for these brands, and the influence it can create which continues to ripple long after the project has been completed. So none of this is to undermine those achievements, but the whole mission statement of Vision GT was for these manufacturers to design their ultimate sports car for Gran Turismo. Through all of these different concepts, the definition of a sports car has been stretched to its absolute limits, but it's the second part of that which is far more important. Gran Turismo. What about any of these cars screams Gran Turismo? Maybe the Copen, but not in a good way. Frankly, I don't believe the fact these cars are being made specifically for Gran Turismo has influenced their designs in any meaningful way. We know that Vision GT is the reason they exist, but I don't see how if they were created for any other purpose they would look or function any different. Gran Turismo is the intended destination, but it's clear that there's been no attempt to mould them to the needs of the game. I've stated how poorly integrated these cars are within the game, but some of them just clearly can't be. Like the Ital design a 1200 horsepower futuristic supercar with an off-road version. Clearly there was no compromise in its conception, and as such it's redundant in GT7 by design. And also it doesn't have an interior view because they designed it without a windshield, and Polyphony let them do this knowing what the consequence of that would be. And furthermore, in the same update that they added it to GT7, they also added full VR support. Come on, it sounds like I'm making this up as a joke, but it's actually true. Now, you would think Vision GT cars would be exclusive to Gran Turismo, right? Well, there have been some exceptions. In 2018, the Infinity Vision GT car ended up in the Asphalt 8 mobile game, and the same would apply for the Bugatti Vision GT as well. Also, the Nissan Vision GT car was added to Nitro Nation 6 in 2019. And on the flip side, the Fittipaldi EF7 Vision GT was actually removed from GT7 before release, as can be seen from one of the trailers. No one knows why for certain, but it seems as though Fittipaldi Motors is now defunct, despite originally having plans to produce 39 real-life examples of the car. Concept cars are often known to exaggerate certain design details, and with Vision GT this is no different. Just take a look at the first official Vision GT car, the Mercedes, to see what I mean. I'm sure this is also why some people are put off by them since they can look very over the top on purpose. It's not to everyone's taste and some would prefer a more down to earth style. For instance, like when I found out that the Ital design was inspired by a previous concept car, which in my opinion looks far better and like something I'd actually want to drive. And this may be why we see people making comparisons to other cars whenever they add a Vision GT, usually from the same brand. The best example is with the Ferrari Vision GT, which as previously stated shares many design cues with the 499P hypercar. The question is then, why couldn't we just get the 499P instead? I know that many people would have much preferred it, and I would be lying if I didn't say that I agree with that as well. And I thought this even last December before the 499P made its real life racing debut, and of course went on to win the 24 hours of Le Mans. And it could slot into Group 1 and as such be far more useful. Maybe there's some sort of licensing issue with the upcoming World Endurance Championship game that means it can't be added, but regardless that taps into the final key point about Vision GT, which is emotional attachment. Most people are far more likely to have an attachment to a car that is real. That is just a fact. With these Vision GT concepts, they effectively start from zero in this regard, and given that these cars are often so useless in the game, you're not really going to build an attachment in that way either. It's a lose-lose situation. Even if you're a diehard fan of Vision GT, assuming they even exist, I strongly suspect that there would be many other real-life cars that you would prefer to have in Gran Turismo. When you consider the factors, that's obvious. It's just basic psychology. And that really gets to the heart of why so many players couldn't care less about Vision GT. From its concept to its implementation, nothing about Vision GT has been considered from the player's point of view. That's just an afterthought. Which is absurd, considering the whole reason why these concepts even exist are to be in the game. But they do such a piss poor job of giving people a reason to care. 
Vision GT is not for the players, because if it were, they have done everything in their power beyond the cars themselves to make it not appeal to people. You cannot look at some of the decisions they've made and say that players are the primary focus, and I highly doubt that any feedback has been taken on board since if we look at the project today, barely anything has changed since 2013. If anything, the shine has worn off and it's become even less appealing. But whenever I talk about the issues with modern Gran Turismo through my GT critique series or more focused videos about the track redesigns and duplicate cars, there is always one common thread that is clear to see, and that is Polyphony making these decisions without considering much of the impact on the people who actually play the game. Gran Turismo is a game, a commercial product, but so often it feels like Polyphony, and more specifically Kaz, are wrapped up in doing what they think is right, what will advance the series in their mind, without stopping to think if it actually makes the player experience any better. Because most of the time, it doesn't, and sometimes it makes it clearly worse. Vision GT isn't making the game worse, but it is still a colossal missed opportunity to work directly with these manufacturers to create something incredible. From an automotive standpoint, that is what they've done, and we've seen the tangible real-world benefits that have come from it. But there are two sides to Vision GT, and one of them is GT, Gran Turismo. So you simply can't label Vision GT a success when it fails so hard in one of its two key areas. And until they realise this and actually do something about it, as players, Vision GT will always be considered a failure. But who knows what the future will bring. Anyway, don't get your hopes up too much, because something tells me that we're not going to be driving these things in real life anytime soon. Why? I don't know, it's just a feeling.